Okay, folks, this is part three of the nutshells on the civil procedure rules based on the contents of this book. We've been doing legal uh, surgeries or phone-ins, if you like, on, on a longer form every two weeks, and these nuggets are dropped in in between those longer phone-in type surgeries to give you concentrated legal juice and golden nuggets of how to navigate your way around the county court system of England and Wales. And specifically today, I'll be talking about, you know, you're up in the air as a pilot, perhaps it's your first time, you want a little bit of the skinny of how to deal with what can feel like something of, you know, an alien environment. So uh, the first thing to say is, how do the courts approach litigants in person? And are litigants in person given some sort of exceptions when it comes to compliance with the civil procedure rules? Uh, now, interesting question. And the ha there has been high level, recent high level judgments on the court's approach to lit litigants in person. Sadly for you, the courts treat you just as they would a lawyer. You don't get special exemptions except in exceptional circumstances from having to comply with the rules. Here's a little illustration from the case in question. Unfortunately, a litigant in person fell foul of a rather sort of innocuous or esoteric little rule that says you have to serve on your opponent by post uh, unless they tell you that they accept service by other means, such as email. Litigant in person had emailed his opponent's solicitors and thought that would be effective service under the, under the CPR. It was decided that it wasn't until and unless he'd got permission from his opponent to serve in that way. So now that being said, OK, in terms of the knockabout world, when you come in front of a deputy district judge or a district judge, and the vast majority of you will be dealing with, you know, smaller claims uh, and just, you know, district judges, not higher judges such as circuit judges, then I find, in my experience, the courts are actually more sensitive in practice. I've got a case at the moment, a really excellent litigant in person who's running her own case, and we're just dropping in and providing legal support at key stages of the proceedings. Um, and in that case, she had completely failed to comply with the requirement to file and serve a defence back in April, yeah, and defence, 14 days. And still in October, uh, she hadn't done her defence. We actually, you know, told her to do a defence. Now, she had some kind of reasons as to why she hadn't, but they weren't really of great merit. Um, so we found ourselves, or rather she found herself, uh, herself in a hearing um, but I suspected that the judge wasn't going to make a point of it. There'd also been breaches of other requirements, witness statements, disclosure, this all going back to a court order that had been sent out to the parties back in April. Uh, at the hearing, the judge was, nah, I've now got your defence, uh, so I'm just going to reset the whole timetable, the whole schedule sort of move it forward six months since you failed to comply. Mayor, you've got your reasons. I'm not going to get into that. I'm a busy judge with a busy caseload. You're litigants in person. Let's just get this on track. He didn't even make a cost order against um, our client. But here's the interesting thing. I think if a lawyer had been in court, a judge you probably would have given them a rough time. See, I'm just going to talk about the difficulties around issuing claims. Now, you have got uh, different ways of issuing a claim. You've got uh, post, yeah, good old regular post, uh, royal mail, snail mail. You have got money claims online. Just Google it, you'll get to their site. Uh, you've also got a pilot service. 
That is just being piloted. You can choose and elect to try that. Uh, and the idea is meant to be more streamlined, more efficient, and you know, get things moving online only through the system more quickly. Thing to remember is, whenever you're issuing any case now, you don't do it at the local county court. You do it at a central kind of sorting office up in Northampton and Salford. Uh, and then the court processes the initial documentation, your particulars of claim, defence, the pleadings, um, spits out directions, questionnaires to get you to fill in. Then it gets moved to your local court. Yeah, uh, A defendant can usually elect their local court. So a claimant will probably have to, in most cases, uh, go for the local court closest to the defendant. So just um, be, be alive to that. Now here's a little interesting uh, nugget of knowledge, uh, and this is to help you, as is in the previous vlog, to get a better grip of, of when and how to use the civil procedure rules to your advantage. We had a case recently, a legal surgery, where a client uh, was right up against it with the limitations, six year limitations rule. Happens quite a lot. People just sort of sit on things, don't they, in life? And then at the last minute, they scrabble around and try and make everything right. Uh, now, actually, it, 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 he had a week before the, the end of the six-year expiry of limitations, which means after that, he's going to have really great trouble bringing a claim. So he was concerned he could go online with money claims online, limit 100,000, only for monetary cases. Yeah. If it's special types of cases, better to post to Salford rather than to go and use money claims online. Uh, as lawyers, we do use post a lot uh, because you can always kind of rely on not falling into any one of the exceptions, which means you might have brought it wrongly through money claims online. But if a simple money claim of under 100,000 money claims online is the natural place to bring it. Uh, the problem was, there was some government statistics that said seven days turnaround for issuing proceedings. Yeah, We looked at civil, we looked at the pilot limit of 10,000 for the pilot, okay? It's just gonna be a fast track way of getting some very low value claims through the system quickly and forcing defendants to produce a defense. Um, that wasn't uh, really appropriate either. So um, we had this dilemma, post it, risk the post not getting to the court in time. And even when it gets to the court, it's gonna sit in a pile of papers. When is someone gonna boom, boom, put that critical issue stamp on the claim form, the M1 and the particulars of claim, which gives you your issue date, which is then the clock that runs for purposes of the six year limitation period. Um, now, if you are in doubt, when, it, you know, when you're issuing a claim, remember, 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 the Bible is the civil procedure rules. We go into you know, greater detail with all of that in the book. When you're in front of a judge in six months time and you're at the, the wrong end of an application by a well-heeled defendant who's got a solicitor and they're saying uh, it's out of time, limitations, that you know, you've got to be thinking about what criteria is the judge going to look at. Ultimately, he has to listen, and probably most, the vast majority of cases, has to take note, obviously, of the civil procedure rules, the Bible. So go into Google and just, you know, civil procedure rules, limitations, issuing a claim. You may well find yourself coming up with a practice direction. Remember, they're the guidance alongside the rules, but, you know, they should be obeyed too. 7a and you discover buried in 7a that there's a little paragraph a subsection that says where it's a question of limitations the clock stops at the time it's received at the court even if it's not been stamped and processed by the court and spat out to the defendant and back to the claimant the claimant should make damn well sure that he's got some form of delivery that uh, means, if not signed for, at least it's confirmed, delivered, and he's got a receipt uh, of the date so that he gets around the limitations. But you have to lead the court. Don't think that the court is just going to, 
you know, um, accept that they have made, have made an error and therefore anything that you've done that fails to comply with any of the civil procedure rules or a court order is the court's fault and they can say, don't worry, Mr. Claimant, Mr. Defendant, we made a cock up. I'm afraid it doesn't, happen, it doesn't work like that. Uh, you need to lead the court by the hand and make sure documents get in front of uh, the judges um, because it all goes through a system of process of administrative staff and court managers and so on but before someone actually takes your document or letter or whatever it is and puts it on the judge's pile and invites them to look at it. So you've got to be quite robust. Uh, just to give you just a, a few examples, you know, Make sure you've read the rider, the footer at the bottom of any court correspondence. Each court may have a different way of operating. 50 megabyte limit, for example, yeah? Um, one single PDF, or do you do a number of PDFs when you're emailing, finding stuff at the court, yeah? If it's an urgent matter and they're hearing in a week, put in the subject box, urgent for hearing on the 14th of November, 2021. Um, on your letters, put it a covering letter in the email, urgent for attention of the judge, you know, and the date of the hearing. So the court staff, you know, you can see you're just putting yourself into the shoes of the court staff and they, they go, oh, okay, this is urgent. Oh, there's a hearing day. Oh, we better deal with that quickly. So uh, and, uh, I've got examples of that because in, the, in a recent hearing, the client had been putting in the urgent, and her, uh, it was interesting, her documents had got to the judge, but the opponent hadn't, and his documents hadn't. So, uh, you know, just be alive, you make sure you put the claim number in the subject box. Application for disclosure claim number X15068 for hearing on the 14th of November. So, you know, in little ways, um, eliminate errors and don't assume everything's going to be processed efficiently at the court. Now make sure that you are copying your opponent. A lot of litigants in person think that they're playing some clever tactical game and they're going to ambush their opponent by not copying them in on an application. Don't do that. The judge is going to sit in front of the two of you and say, so has everybody got the papers in respect of this application by the claimant? And the claimant goes, yeah, well, I followed with the court. Yeah, but have you, did you serve it on your opponent? Yeah, I did yesterday. Well, that's not enough time. He's not got time to prepare a response to your application. Hearing vacated costs against you. So make sure that you uh, include the court, uh, include your opponent in, uh, in correspondence, particularly you know, where applications are concerned. You may need, in certain bigger cases, let's say it's a two hour strikeout application, certainly for a trial uh, or a long disclosure application, you're the, claim the claimant has to lead the process. So you're responsible for preparing bundles. So you might want to put in a bundle of all the documents that you need the judge to look at for purposes of that hearing. You're, you know, just like in the, in the skies as a fighter pilot, you only spend, you know, 30 minutes in an actual dogfight. Yeah, but when you're in the dogfight, you want to be absolutely properly prepared. You know, you do not want your trigger to jam. You want to make sure that the magazine is loaded. So a judge is going to be very busy. So make sure that you, you, you've prepared him with a, um, supplied him with a, with a bundle, which you've also copied on your opponent. And, you know, with the application on top, with your witness statement underneath, any other court orders, you know, and put it, and, and number it. Print it out, uh, this is what we do as lawyers, and put, a, you know, well you can use PDF, can't you to do it, but, you know, pr no harm in printing out and just numbering one, two, bottom right hand corner. Uh, so you can say, please, Your Honour, as I've mentioned in my witness statement, page 18, the defendant uh, wrote to me on the 15th of October saying, F off, uh, I'm not supplying you that disclosure. I don't think it's relevant to the issues in the case, you know. Um, oh, yes. So make sure that if you're, particularly if you're a claimant, but if you're a defendant making an application, the onus is on you to prepare the bundle. Uh, make sure that you've eliminated every possibility of the uh, court not actually being able to get going because they haven't got the paperwork in front of them. This happens more than often than you did realise that a debt recovery, uh, sorry, not a debt recovery, a, a default judgment application, 
um, in the spring. The judge was working from home online, didn't have um, the pleadings, half the papers. Uh, I think he may have had the particulars of claim and the defence, actually, but not the application itself, not the opponent's response, not a bunch of other documents, because the court hadn't supplied it with him in time. He went, well, let's crack on anyway. Uh, you know, if you think it's tactically advantageous to crack on, crack on. If you think, well, no, the documents that the judge has got exclude a critical witness statement, say, look, Your Honour, Sir, Madam... Uh, look, sir, I just don't feel that uh, I can go forward with this because that one is critical and it really is important to my application that you read it. I'd like the hearing vacated, you know, and be firm and strong about that. If he then go says, well, let's crack on anyway, you've, you've got kind of grounds for appealing a decision that you get that you don't like or challenging it. OK, now, do look at core orders. Big, big one, this. Court orders are really important, and even lawyers don't read them properly. Uh, if you, a bit like the civil procedure rules, you can quote the civil procedure rules as a judge, yeah? You can quote a court order at a judge or at your opponent. Uh, this is a really kind of sneaky way of getting the jump on an opponent sitting down and carefully reading all of that court order. Most people don't, including lawyers. They skim read it, file it. Oh, the hearing's on the 15th, okay. And then, it, and then when it gets to the hearing, they discover, oh, a bundle shall be served 14 days before the hearing by the claimant. Oh, a skeleton arguments will be da 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 da. Ah, oh, damn it. And then you're scrambling, yeah? And then you're not giving your opponent time to put in a resp to actually respond to the bundle, and therefore the bundle that's filed at court may not include documentation that your opponent insists form part of the bundle, and you can see how you're in danger of a hearing being vacated and having a cost order against you. Read those court orders. Okay, uh, in terms of the hearings themselves, now I'm talking about interim or interlocutory hearings. Civil litigation is peppered with, in, in the bigger cases especially, little hearings, case and cost management hearings, preliminary 10-minute hearings or 30-minute hearings, um, applicate pre-trial reviews, you know, application hearings, special application hearings for something... Uh, you know, you're going to get a lot of these interim hearings. It's quite critical. Um, now, here's the thing. Don't expect that the hearing is just going to be about the thing that it's listed for. You know, app, uh, hearing to hear an application by the defendant for disclosure. Yeah. Uh, litigants in person get wedded emotionally to their case. Oh, the defendant has failed to make disclosure by such a date and I haven't got witness statements from them either, you know. Uh, rah, 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 rah. So they make an application on an N2444, gets listed for an hour or two hour hearing and they think the whole hearing is just going to be about those issues and they're going to win because the defendant has failed to comply with an earlier court order. Um, now, that's a dangerous, uh, dangerous strategy. Um, two reasons. What happens often is that the hearing is not about that issue at all. Because by the time of the hearing, your opponent's probably done something like written to you and apologised, explaining why it was, that it was they didn't make disclosure or, or exchange a witness statement. And it may be partially an error by the claimant that's caused them to fail to comply with the court order in respect of witness statements and disclosure. Um, and so they, they comply. They are then, it, you are then in danger of having a cost order against you for a two hour hearing on disclosure and witness statements. It's unnecessary because in the run up to the hearing, in the few, few, few or couple of weeks before the hearing, they've given you the disclosure and the witness statements. And now you're just ignoring them and saying, I want to get to court and give you a roasting because you failed to. Um, you failed to comply with the court order. You need to step back, see the wood for the trees. And the court is going to be looking at, look, what is the case management challenge I've got today? 
it may be that the trial date is not for another six months. It's not too bothered about non-compliance with the disclosure and witness statements order, um, as I've alluded to in that earlier example. So um, be prepared to deal with something completely different. The judge is not necessarily only going to deal with what is you know, stated on the court order that the hearing should be about, um, if that makes sense. So you've got to be looking at the case in the round and then the case management needs of the case in the, in the round, yeah? Um, right, so finally, I just wanted to touch on the issue of uh, legal resources in terms of, um, you know, uh, how to get help. Obviously, uh, we offer help, um, pay, uh, paid help. You have to pay for it, though, of course. Uh, but there are other avenues. Uh, Citizens Advice Bureau, of course, very good, uh, but very general. And they won't give you tailored advice on the documents of your case, yeah, which you could actually say means that general advice isn't much use. Um, if, also, unfortunately, uh, there's not much legal aid around. There is some legal aid, but uh, unfortunately, the government is making huge cuts and there's just not much legal aid around any longer. So you're unlikely in civil litigation, more possible in family, for instance, and obviously in crime. But in civil litigation, you're unlikely to get legal aid. Uh, what you could get, though, is if you can demonstrate that you're of low income, especially if you're on benefits, you can get a court fee waived. Now, that's massive if you're a claimant bringing a claim of, let's say, it's £10,000. That's a claim fee of £500. If it's £100,000, you know, that's a pretty whopping claim fee of £5,000, yeah. So uh, be aware of means testing and the way that can help you avoid incurring unnecessarily court fees. There is the bar pro bono unit. When I was training as a barrister, I did some uh, little employment and social security uh, tribunal work for free in order to cut my teeth as a trainee lawyer. So you might find uh, a trainee lawyer willing to help you. Um, <laughs> insurance, now a lot of people have legal expenses insurance, they probably don't even know they have it, it's been bolted on somewhere in their life, perhaps when they bought a property. Um, I, I very rarely find, I find it actually is fit for purpose. I mean, isn't that the case with insurance policy? You know, you get, it's the same, you know, you, with a car, you discover that, oh, I've got insurance, and then it's a windscreen damage or a tire puncture. Oh, there's an exclusion. You've got to pay for an extra type of insurance to cover that, and then probably an extra insurance to cover the stuff that the excess insurance doesn't cover. Uh, which makes my uh, blood boil, the, the way the insurance industry works. is such a rip-off, playing on your fears in order to flog you a product, which then turns out ultimately not to be very useful. Certainly in the area of legal expenses insurance, I found that to be the case. You're provided with a panel of solicitors you have to use under the policy. They will do some cases and not others. Um, they will you know, have kind of fee caps, potentially, um, and it, 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 I've dealt with, from my experience, I've dealt with a few clients who've come to me where the legal expenses insurance has led them to a, a law firm that hasn't done a proper job with their case. So I'm not entirely impressed with legal expenses insurance. Other ways of getting help and support, well, I think, you know, I think uh, I will beat, beat or bang the drum here. Uh, I just think there's a growing need for uh, the legal profession, for legal services sector to provide litigants in person with judicious, loyal light services that you pay for, but it's um, but not necessarily through a law firm, and uh, you get you know decent legal advice or, uh, for key parts of your case, so that you're not totally exposed when it comes to running a claim. Um, there are, of course, books. Um, you've seen my book. 
but you know, you could do worse and go to a, a law school and see what sort of books the uh, law students are using. But if you do, don't become an expert at the law, the substantive law. Find the book that tells you how to deal with the procedure, the tactics, the actual dogfight itself of bringing or defending a claim in the, as in the, civil, court, in the civil courts of England and Wales. OK, thanks, folks. That's all for today. Uh, if you need help, th there's a featured video on the channel uh, that I'll link below, which explains how we offer services to the great unwashed public of England and Wales. Uh, we find legal surgeries 150 no VAT for an hour where we work with you uh, often on Skype and share screens and we can see your documents or you PDF your documents and we go through your documents in that hour and give you the kind of like the um, Citizens Advice Bureau Plus service where we're actually looking at documentation and giving you proper tailored advice about your case, not just general advice. So we find that clients... Um, uh, often the starting point for cases is one-hour legal surgery.